why give a patient hand over? Well, there's a number of reasons. And most of you wouldn't probably even think about it. It's just that you get to the, to the hospital or you get to the next shift or whatever it is, and you pass on the details of the patient. You don't even think about that what you're actually doing. It's just part of the job. But there are reasons for this, why you give a patient hand over, important reasons. The obvious is, I've already said them, shift changes, transfer of personnel. So you've done with your shift, you've done your 8, 10, 12 hours, whatever it is, and you want to move on, but you're, you're actually responsible for, a, for patient care at that particular time. Okay, you can't just walk away. You have to let somebody else know there's a person in the bed, there's a person waiting for care, whatever it might be. So that change of shift is an obvious reason why you need to give a patient handover. For paramedics, transfer of responsibility and accountability. You've finished everything that you can do for a person. You've picked them up at their home, you've provided all the care, you've taken them to hospital, and here you are in quite usually the emergency department, might be elsewhere in the hospital, and you now need to say, this person now belongs to you in clinical aspect of care, okay? So there's another reason. And also underneath that, there's patient safety. There's plenty of evidence that says that ineffective communication is a recognized factor in patient harm. You fail to mention something or you get something wrong or whatever it is, and somebody else then relies on those words and that that now impacts and influences patient care in an adverse way. So we need to be mindful of that. So there, there are lots of reasons why you give patient handover. So what is a patient handover? Again, fundamentally obvious question. So let's have a look at that. It's verbal and written communication about a patient. And in this case, it's usually the clinical aspect. It's the clinical care. You're not necessarily talking about uh, any other. There'll be, there'll be handovers that you can provide on a person's personal life uh, experiences, like their, their welfare, whether or not they're able to look after themselves in independent living. And there, there are often things like that that can overlap. Maybe you're talking about financial matters in different guises, but we're talking about clinical here. And I said verbal and written. We're gonna focus on the verbal today, but don't forget there is that written aspect, that there, it is just as important. The written will contain far more detail. I'm not going to go into too much detail on exactly what that is on written. Okay, that could be a whole different session in its own right. But we will border and touch on it. Mindful to say that when you say something in your handover, your verbal handover, everything you say will ultimately end up in your written report. What goes into your written report, though, will contain far more information, far more detail whatever form that report takes. So the, the trick here will be to say, what is the pricey, what is the condensed version that I need to say? And what is all the extra stuff, the detail and so forth that needs to be reported in the written report, which is important. There's always a difference of opinion in surveys between medical and nursing personnel and paramedics. Paramedics think that the written report is almost a waste of time. I write this stuff, I give it to you, and no one will ever look at that again. No one will care, okay? On the other hand, Medical staff always say it's very important because they too have their chains of shifts, people move along, there's multiple staff. I didn't receive the handover, so the only thing I have now, the record, is to go to that written report, those notes. I'll be looking after this patient three, four, five days time after they've arrived in the hospital. I can't possibly talk to the paramedic crew. So the notes are incredibly important. So there's often that mismatch. Suffice to say, when you're talking about written, I would say, write everything like you're a medical professional, because you are, write everything such that one day a judge or a coroner might be looking at it, one day a close family member might be looking at it. So just write with those sort of things in mind. It's not a piece of paper that's just going to disappear. Let's come back to the verbal though as we go through here because this is part of the handover that we need to look at. Handover to whom and whom not. So for paramedics, ideally that will be to a triage nurse. You'll arrive, there's a person at the front desk who's specifically there, amongst other jobs, to greet you and to then decide what's wrong with this person, what level of priority will they have, where will they go in, in their hospital system, in their emergency department. So the first thing you need to do is identify who that person is and then give them enough information to facilitate their decision. So for paramedics, this is important because there might be two layers of patient handover enough to get the, to, the, to fill the information for that first person so they can make their decision. But then the person inside is actually going to take responsibility for patient care for the next while. We need to recognise who that is, okay? And that can be important. You don't hand over to someone who's not actually going to be involved in looking after the patient care because the information will go to them and may not actually play a major part in the patient care. So we just need to identify to whom and to whom not necessarily to give the patient detail. 
Okay, and then you'll have other people who come up to you and, and they might be administrative people, clerks and so forth, who want to know who the patient is, who want to produce the, 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 the identification labels and so forth. They don't necessarily need any of the clinical aspects, but they may need enough personal information so that they can retrieve past histories and files and so forth. So just target who you're talking to when you give your history. Ideally include patients. Now this is a good thing. You shouldn't talk about people necessarily when they're they're not within earshot and so forth. This information that you're passing on is about them. It's their information too, okay? And quite often, this will be an opportunity when people will have an, a, a, an ability to correct you or to straighten out maybe something that you've had in your mind. A number of times I've said to a, 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 you know, a, a, a triage nurse, now listen, um, the patient is um, still has their, their chest pain ongoing and the patient will then say, actually, it's been gone for a little while now while I've been waiting here at this, uh, this reception area. And so they can correct a few things like that. But they should be there so that you can include them and understand them. And so when you say this is the, the identify the patient, they will agree with you. Yes, that's me. Okay. Where this is a problem, we'll go into some more detail here. Where and, and when. Generally, when is as soon as you arrive and you want to talk to the triage person as soon as possible, particularly if there's an emergency. And when will be as soon as you get into the place where the patient is ultimately going to be left in the hospital bed, wherever that is. And uh, you want to, as soon as you place them there, you want to be able to hand over to the next person so that their care is continuous without a, a break. There are also the where places. Unfortunately, in busy emergency departments and so forth, controlling the where and when can be a bit of a challenge. What to include? This is what we're going to be talking about mostly today. So we'll come back to that. But we will be providing relevant past information, relevant current presentation. So a little bit about the person, exactly why you're here today, what, what the problem is, and some relevant future planning about what needs to be done. Okay, so if, you, if you've initiated care and so forth, you can then say, well, okay, this person still has uh, yeah, some, some trauma, traumatic fractures, has some ongoing pain and so forth. So clearly that's going to need some ongoing care. We can't just ignore that. We've started, we can't resolve the problem, and that will need ongoing care. So you don't obviously need to sit down and go, I think the person needs to go upstairs for angiography or whatever else. Clearly they're hospital decisions and so forth, and not yours. Um, but there are some things that are immediately relevant that you've started care and it needs to be continuing. So we need to use a standardised communication with a structure. Let's have a look at some of those structures and not only use a structure, but actually be familiar and, and comfortable in using the structure, understand the structure, understand why it's there. Let's go into that because we're going to look at a couple of things now. What in the nursing community and particularly in the paramedic community are commonly used, the, 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 the acronyms for them are ISBA, we'll talk about that, or I may stand by. So let's have a look at both of those. ISBA, first of all, simply put, okay, I-S-B-A-R, they're the letters, let's have a look at those. So identify the patient. The first thing you want to do is say, you know, hello there, let me introduce to you, Mr. Brown, goes under the name of Jack, so you can feel free to call him Jack, because that's what he's told me to call him. Okay, Mr. Brown goes under the name of Jack, 64 year old male. It doesn't need to be a whole lot, it just needs to be, this is who I'm talking about. So you've got a bit of an age, you've got a name, you've got just that, that enough to be able to say, okay, I'm, this is who we're both on the same page, we're talking about this person here. The situation, cut to the chase. The first thing anybody wants to know is, why are you here? When you walk in the door on a call out, you walk in, the first thing you want to know is, why have you called us? Why am I here? The next person you hand over to is going to want the same thing. Why are you here? Why are you on my front doorstep at, this, at my emergency department? What is going on? So this is 64-year-old Jack. He's had, uh, he called us tonight because he had an acute chest pain. He'd had it for about two hours before we arrived. So there, that's why we're here. He's got uh, COPD and he's had uh, uh, a sort of two-day exacerbation, but it got much worse tonight. He was trying to get to the toilet at four in the morning and he's uh, stumbled and had a fall and his family found him on the floor. That's why we're here. That's what it's all about. Okay, so it puts people in the zone of what's wrong. Background. This is where you really need to be important of what can be written down and what really needs to be said. People will be on lots of medications, will have multiple comorbidities and so forth. Are they important to this particular job? If a person has chest pain and they have, uh, you know, they've had a, a, a previous history of cardiac chest pain, perhaps they've had angiography, bypass and so forth, clearly relevant, okay? Maybe some risk factors and so forth that says, okay, the person who's being, we're being pushed down a particular pathway here with the chest pain and with the, with the rest of it that says maybe we should be considering acute coronary syndrome because 
that's what you've been doing for the last half hour. So maybe we should keep considering that. So give that pertinent background. If it's not necessarily relevant, just write it down. It doesn't need to get in the way of the handover because it becomes distracting. So you're telling me about his gout and his arthritis and his chest pain. Is there something else? Am I, did I mis mishear what you said at the start? Are we here for another problem? Okay, so this is your first opportunity to start to filter it out. So identification, what's going on, why we're here, and enough relevant background to support why we're here, what's associated with that call out. Um, assessment, again, another point. So this is the IFBA. Uh, this is the, what is it that I need to say now about this person? Now, you'll have lots of stuff that you'll be able to put in, lots of things that you, you found out. The patient was wearing his uh, pyjamas at the time. Was that relevant? Well, it may be if the person was wearing their pyjamas and it's 11 o'clock in the morning and they've been, been found by the home help person and clearly, and they're lying on the floor, because it says to you, clearly they've been lying there all night. Okay, uh, that's, that's the sort of the conclusion you would draw. And that then leads you into all the conclusions that follow that about dehydration, incontinence, hypothermia, and whatever else might come with being lying on the floor. So in a context, that observation is important. In other contexts, if it's four in the morning, You'd expect someone to be lying in bed in their pyjamas, so it's not important to say. So just filter through what do you need to say that is important, what's not important. Okay, vital signs. You don't need to sit there and go on and on about all the vital signs and everything else in detail, okay? Sometimes you can price it down. Okay, he's got an anterior chest pain that's, uh, that's consistent with his previous cardiac presentation. Or anterior chest pain that's not, not that's poorly localised, not changed by breathing. So we really, we're not able to draw any other conclusions here than it's cardiac, that sort of stuff. Enough to just quickly condense it down to say, this is why I'm thinking it, this is why you should think it. Vital signs, all unremarkable, all within normal limits. You don't need to roll off necessarily all the other stuff, okay, unless it's particularly important. Then, then highlight that, okay. His blood pressure has been, been borderline hypotensive from the start, uh, and his blood pressure is actually, in the last one we took, was actually only 80 systolic. Okay, that, that sort of thing, that's relevant, that's pertinent, that's worth throwing out there, making sure that they get that, okay, but not all the rest of the detail. And recommendation, that might be, um, what are you doing for the patient? So we've been administering ongoing morphine, it still has not yet relieved the pain. Okay, so it says to someone, well, we're probably going to have to continue that pathway. So it's worth putting someone, again, you're not saying, I think you need to do this, this and this, um, but you're saying, this is where we are at in the patient care. I've had success or not, partial success, and I think that's probably need to be, keep going. So the ISPAR works quite well with the, with the medical patient. It also works quite well with the traumatic patient. So it'll work in either, either case. So again, you just come back to saying, okay, um, introduce the patient. It's 24-year-old uh, Michael, who uh, was involved in a high-speed uh, you know, motor car accident. Again, you get rid of some of the jargon like MCA and, and RTA and other things that people use, depending on what you use. Motor car accident, say the words, it's quite clear. High-speed motor car accident was trapped by the lower legs for 45 minutes um, before it was freed by heavy rescue extrication. Okay, Even in a busy tra acute, a trauma centre where they all want to get on with looking after this really sick person, they're going to give you that much time to be able to say that. It puts it in a context. We're looking after a person. This is what's happened to them. We're all with it. We're all understanding. It's a motor car accident, high speed, major damage, trapped for a period of time on scene. Then you go on with the, the sort of the, 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 that, that same approach again. The what have we? What's relevant? Relevant in terms of past medical history. There may not be anything relevant necessarily when you're talking about trauma. Okay, the fact that you've got a history of this, a history of that, um, may not necessarily be relevant to trauma. They occasionally will be. What might be particularly relevant though are the sort of the yeah, the, the sort of things that, that, that you found and observed straight away in terms of their injuries and so forth, or whether the person was able to get out of the car and self-extricate and walk around and so forth. The sort of things that can put you into some sort of contact. Try and take the person in terms of the trauma setting to the scene with as few words as possible. So anybody listening can say, okay, I've got a picture of what that must have looked like, how badly destroyed that car was, or how relatively minor the trauma was, or whatever else. And then again, come back to vital signs. Are there anything that's particularly important? Don't need to fill up necessarily. That'll be written down, the written report, a lot of the stuff. But is there anything you really need to highlight that somebody would go, oh, okay, been tachycardic with a pulse of 130 for the last 15 minutes. Sort of suggestive that there's something really going on, pain, hemorrhage, and so forth. I need to 
throw that out there really quickly, really importantly.